Hey, welcome back to Neckbeardia, the place where we got but a microphone and a dream. You know what's coming up next. It's more Stranded in Fantasy, starting off with Journal Entry 291. Come morning, we took on a handful of passengers and their cargo and took off. It was cramped, even on deck, but we were fine. I calculated the direction to go when we took off. Jason is being tutored by our pilot on how to fly. He's definitely taken with her and I can see why. So a few hours into our flight, we all gathered and tried to decide what to name the ship. No one could agree on anything and I got quite heated. We limited names to two words or less. Avery wanted to name it the Enterprise. Jason wanted to name it the Golden Hind. Mike wanted the Beagle. Marcus chose Zero Gravitas. Alex wanted the Argo, and I chose Serenity. While we work out that problem, I figure we should arrive in Alien sometime tomorrow, unless we suddenly suffer a mid-air explosion or crash into the inconceivable. Our passengers think we're all insane from the friendly bickering, but they're holding up well. I'm thinking that maybe we can rent out our ship under our pilot when we're not using it and rake in the money. We'll have to be careful not to piss off the merchant guild too much, but I figure maybe we can open up a temporary alien to Brightly route. I'll talk to our pilot later about this. She's more experienced in these matters. Journal Entry 292 We made it to alien today. Kind of. Everything was going fine. We were around 10 feet above the air dock when whatever keeps us in the air suddenly cut out. No one was seriously injured, but the hull is damaged. Luckily, we know some artificers. Speaking of that, we headed to the university first thing and paid our three students a visit. Austin is doing well and was apparently working on a magic steam engine with a master artificer when we arrived. Ian started training in some spell casting combined with his swordsmanship, something like an arcane fighter or dusk blade maybe. Max... Max has caused some problems. His class went out to some field to practice and he tossed out a spell he had learned on his own that he apparently shouldn't have been able to cast and immediately lost control of it. People were injured, but luckily no one was killed. It hasn't slowed him down any, but he's being more cautious about it. We all gathered up in the local tavern and told them of the war, the Devil Army, and our victories, and our new slightly broken toy. Austin got all excited about the airship and who knows what he's going to do with it, but he got permission to repair it. Raina showed up with the baby and joined our little celebration and made some overt threats that we'd have been dinner if Marcus had bit it out there. I'm starting to like her less and less. Journal Entry 293 Since we can't hang out at Raina's place, we're all set up at the inn. If this city is going to be our home base, we'd best get a home here. The inns are nice, but still an inn. Anyways, paid a visit to the university to see about some side project, namely what to do about the Rhinegraf Spymaster. They think they can bind him to a location, an anchor, and produce an enchanted pin. Put it on him, and if it works like they think it does, he should be stuck. I'm going to give it to Jason. He seems to know when he's going to show up before he actually does, or at least has light speed reflexes. Maybe Spymaster related precog, or more likely that ruby eye letting him see something. In other news, Austin has checked out the airship wreck, did some research, and presented me a design. He wants to build what looks like a tilt rotor wing on it. Sure, it looked neat, but that's not how airships work here. It won't fit in the air docks with the wings like that. He's gone back to the drawing board. He at least understands how flimsy these things are in the air though, and was planning redundancies out the ass. In the meantime, the hull is being repaired at cost, and should be back up in the air within the week. Jason has been keeping our pilot busy, showing her the more secluded parts of town. Avery, on the other hand, is talking about laying her own personal siege on the Sun Church. After what happened last time, I don't know if that's such a good idea, but I got her back either way. Journal Entry 294 So between designing our airship changes, Austin finished his magic steam engine. Jason and I went over and we discussed what to do with it, 
It's a small prototype, simple expansion engine. Our first idea was a car. Unfortunately, we can't produce tires. As near as we can figure, worldwide rubber production is uh, nil. Rubber trees may not even exist here. We could put it in an airship, but that won't make it any safer than the current ones. That leaves trains. Why would anyone use trains over airships? Well, they can haul much more cargo. That may be a problem, though. It can potentially haul more than any city can currently export. The world might not be ready for this. Austin is going to put it on the back burner for now, but we'll produce a small-scale train for demonstration purposes once he's done with the airship. Maybe something to the main farmsteads and back, or maybe around town as public transportation for those who can't afford the expense of bicycles. In other news, the last of my big pins died. I am officially using one of the local ball points that have made their way here. It's not as smooth, but it works well enough. I donated my empties to the Master Artificer. Since there's no such thing as a patent office here, he could start producing his own brand. We can make a fortune off of them and fuck the Merchant's Guild. Journal Entry 295 Avery decided it was time, grabbed her gear grabbed most of us and charged for the sun church she said she had a vision she was very clear no casualties well they were not happy to see us that's for sure we walk in look over the place in a room full of paladins clerics and priests avery walks right up to the pulpit tosses out the head priest knocks over the podium lights up like a holy beacon and declares that it's time for a change that girl has some fucking balls. They aren't having any of this and try firing off their holy lasers and smites. It's not happening. They're all shocked. Avery starts laying down the laws as written and how it's time to start following them again to do as they preach. Anyone that tried getting close gets burned, even us. They were forced to listen or leave. About a quarter of them left with their iconography burned off, and for what I picked up, they were going to the Peace and Love Church to enlist. The rest were inspired, entranced by what she was doing. She went on for four hours. Hell, she's still going on. I don't know how to handle this. Yesterday, she was just Avery, a close friend a sister who keeps reading my journal behind my back and who I have playful fights with when we're bored. Now suddenly it's like she's becoming some kind of divine figure. How does anyone deal with this? Journal Entry 296 Avery is still at the church doing her thing. It's really not my thing, so I slummed around town for a bit and then oversaw the airship repairs. It looks about done. Austin's been adding auxiliary slash emergency engines to keep it in the air should the mains fail. So why do the mains fail? Well, sometimes it just does, apparently. It's a thing with artificing enchantments. There's a tiny percent chance that's just going to fuck up at some point, and it increases with the wear and tear. The auxiliaries are there to keep us up until the mains can be repaired which any artificer can do in under an hour in normal circumstances, apparently, or limp to the nearest port. So aside from that, he wants to add pontoons for water landings and is still going on about adding wings. As long as they fit the air dock, I don't mind, I guess. Journal Entry 297 Avery is still at the church. Still, she's got her hands full. I decided to keep myself busy and paid a visit to university. I visited the Scion instructor first. We had a good mind rape session and he recommended that I start meditating and expanding my mind but without drugs and see where I end up. He demonstrated some techniques, I guess. Afterwards, I paid a visit to the Master Artificer to see if he could do anything with our broken electronics. He didn't have a clue how they work, but said he had some ideas. He took the MP3 player and kindled to his work counter and grabbed some tools and threw around some spells while poking at them. Maybe if I knew anything about artificing, I'd have an idea of what he was doing. But I don't. He said it would take a day or more, so I left him to his work. 
After that, I visited the summoners and had a talk as to why the devils have been treating us the way they have. It kind of baffled the summoners, and they summoned up a... One of them said it was a... Brachina? He had me stand behind a wall. The devil showed up and starts doing its wheeling and dealing, and then I step out from behind the wall. It shuts right up and won't say a thing. I get up as close as I can to the summoning circle without crossing the line, and it doesn't move, just watching me. The summoners start asking questions, trying to make deals. Nothing. Apparently, when a warlock instructor tried doing this a year ago with us, it was thought of as a fluke. They continued bombarding it with questions until it finally said something. It asked, not demanded, to be sent back. They suggested we try summoning a demon tomorrow and see if we can get anything out of that. Journal Entry 298 Had lunch with Avery today. She looks tired. She's a little afraid of what she's doing. What she's becoming. And there's still so much to do. All of this work is only going to affect this particular branch. She did check the church archives or anything pertaining to canons and found nothing of interest. It's a 300 year old entry about reassigning new clerics and training to maintain the city canon. We haven't seen any sign of any canon in the city. The only place it would make sense to have one would be on the outer wall. Jason and Marcus are going to go check it out while I pay a visit to the university. First thing was first, the artificer. He managed to fix the Kindle. It looks like new but has a metallic sheen to it. How the hell? The MP3 player on the other hand, somehow it went wrong and it's become a small 6 inch tall golem of some sort that's escaped and was last heard blasting Madonna down the halls before it escaped the city. That one broke my brain for a while. And what was Mike doing with Madonna on his fucking MP3 player? I managed to make it to the summoning on schedule, however. They had me get behind a wall, and then summoned up a succubus. It turned on the charm right away. They had me come out, and she started laughing, and turned up the charm even more. I asked her what she knew of Terrans, and why the devil sees up and were around. She told a tale, some of it real, some of it not. The real parts. Well, apparently 1500 years ago, Demons and devils can come and go as they pleased. One of the first groups of Terrans arrived, and to make a long story short, one of them was a lawyer of some kind, and put the devils and demons into some kind of binding arbitration, effectively banning them from warring against each other on this plane, and keeping them from being able to manifest on their own here. She also seemed to suggest that he went on to become a top-ranking devil lord. From that point on, the devils were ordered never to make a deal with a Terran under any circumstance. Demons have no such order, and have made attempts at collecting Terran travelers for their own uses against devils with little success. Well, that answers some questions, I guess. Journal Entry 299 The airship's hull is finally fixed. Aside from the auxiliary engines, Austin's changes have yet to be implemented. While he prepares that, I have set up a trade run for our pilot to Brightly and back. Marcus, Austin, and Alex are heading out with her. It should be a 24-hour run. Austin is hard at work getting his upgrades ready between his class. The other two, Ian and Max, are on their first adventure trip out to one of the local dungeons with some more experienced adventurers. Best of luck to them. Hopefully Max won't accidentally nuke the region. After the airship left, I had a surprise visit from Reyna, baby and everything. She wants to know why Marcus isn't getting a larger cut of the profit since he has a family to feed. She's trying to emotionally blackmail me. Fuck that noise. Even cuts for all. I made it very clear that I wasn't changing the group policy. What was she even going on about? She's a dragon. Doesn't she have a mountain of gold somewhere? Or is she living in Aegon because it's the equivalent of a dragon hobo? Hell, she originally wanted Marcus to run off and be a farmer. I don't get her at all. Anyways, I'm starting to worry about Avery. 
I'm seeing less and less of her lately because of her work at the church. Do you even read my journal anymore, Avery? Journal Entry 300 A troop of worn-out, dirty adventurers arrived in town. Mike's warlock girlfriend among them. He's off to see her. Maybe he can tell her about the MP3 golem running around the market district blasting like a virgin and terrorizing the locals. Anyways, the airship arrived today carrying wood products from Brightly, and more importantly, profits. The wealth was distributed and another run is going to be lined up in a few days. Jason has finished scouring the city and found what he thinks was a cannon mount and one cannonball. So at some point, this kitty, this kitty, this city had a cannon. Hey all you cool cats and kittens, fuck me. We checked the city records in the Peace and Love Church and with the translator found that around the time the last Terrans were here, a cannon was made to defend it from an unexpected attack from a big war that was consuming the continent at the time. It was never used as Alien was too isolated to get involved. It was maintained for a while, then it was melted down around 200 years ago for its metal content because no one knew what it was anymore. It was listed as a statue. What else has been lost? I see we're going to have to look into the dissemination of knowledge now as well. I'm going to have that Earth book duplicated and drop a copy to every city's archives at our airship visits. We also need to invent the printing press. I'm going to drop that one on the artificer tomorrow. That leaves the issue that somewhere, one of the churches, or at least a few members, know things that they shouldn't, and they're keeping it for themselves. We'll just see about that. Journal Entry 301 I paid a visit to the Master Artificer with Jason, and we told him all about the printing press. His eyes lit up and not with magic. The possibility of not having to use messy copy pens or having to wait all day with the dupe box, he loved that idea. Of course, he's having the all-time consuming problem of too much to do and not enough time. He's thinking about turning his artificing class into a workshop to start churning out all these wonders we keep giving him, or at least start a second after-class group to do this. In other news, Austin finished the wings and attached them to the airship. Delta style wings. We grabbed our pilot, Jason, Alex, and Ian, and went up to try it out. We can bank this airship now. The good thing is that we now have superb maneuverability. The downside is that it's easy to lose our footing and go falling over the side. Austin's going to work on that along with reinforcing them since they started vibrating when we got up to speed. So far, so good though. Afterwards, we had lunch with Avery. She's looking better, more rested. We all had a long talk about what's going on. She's setting up some of her strong believers up to take over the church so she can move on to other things, like dealing with the other church branches. She wants to travel with us, so that's good. We discussed what we're going to do next, but nothing came to mind other than visiting other cities. It was a good lunch, even if that goddamn MP3 golem was somewhere nearby playing Don't Cry For Me Argentina the whole time. Journal Entry 302 So I've been trying this meditation thing the Scion instructor suggested I do over the last few days and I may have hit pay dirt. I'm sitting there and suddenly I'm floating through town, almost dreamlike. People are reacting to me in shock and surprise, and then I realize that I'm not in my body and instantly snap back. What the fuck was that? I thought I had dozed off, but there's a word on the street of a ghost or a wraith running around when I went out. I paid a visit to the Scion instructor and he said I can apparently detach. What the fuck? So what happens if I can't snap back? I'm actually kind of worried about this. Speaking of new tricks, Austin is adding a tail to the rear and canards to the front of the airship. I hope he realizes he's going to confuse the hell out of the pilot with all the new controls. Speaking of which, we finally managed to break the name tie for the airship. Jason wins. We're calling it the Golden Hind. We're having it painted in English on the side, and then in common in smaller lettering. As for the color to paint it, we're going primarily with red, because red makes everything faster. Journal Entry 303 
So I'm sitting down to start my meditation session when Jason walks in and starts talking about trade routes between A and Brightly and Winterfield. I'm wondering why the hell he chose now to decide to talk about this when suddenly the Rhinegraft spy master appears, knives and all. Without thinking, I unleash a mind bolt at him, which of course does nothing. Jason's already got him disarmed and the anchor pin on him. How the hell does he move so fast? The spy master seems displeased. We tie him up, get the others, and drag him to the university to find out what the hell is going on with this guy. The researchers manage to render him unconscious with some magic and start poking and prodding. Well, he's not an infernal, but he shares similar properties. It baffled them for a while until the master artificer started his analysis. He's got subdermal enchantments everywhere. Like someone tore him apart and re-enchanted every piece as they put him back together while adding in metal reinforcements. How the hell is that even possible? It's a goddamn magical transhuman trans elf. Did the Rhinegrafts pay for this procedure or did they hire him like this? Did they buy him? Anyways, as far as we can tell, every time we killed him, he has some kind of fail-safe magic recall and then he regenerates. So, how do we stop him? We have to break down every enchantment. The university wants to keep him for study. As long as they keep him caged and away from me, I'm fine with that. Journal Entry 304 so Austin finished his current round of upgrades, and we gave them a test run to make sure they wouldn't just snap off. Sure enough, the pilot's having some trouble adapting, but she's doing an admirable job. Austin provided her with boots that keep her locked firmly in place, even if the ship flips over. I'm calling them magic gravity boots for now. So while we're in air dock, the other trade airship is also in dock, the Celestial Rose captained by a certain adventurous shifter. He swaggers over and declares that his ship is faster. Well, that just won't stand. Austin starts bragging, so he challenges us to an air race, to the mountains and back, a two hour ride, two laps. I'm pretty sure we just kicked off the first air race in the world. Word spreads around town pretty quick and we got spectators. Even the MP3 golem gets into it and is running around town playing speed metal. The Rose dumps its cargo to lighten up. Only the basic crew, namely the artificer and the pilot. Austin's all excited. Some university professors are tagged official judges. Bets are made and the countdown begins. One of the judges fires off a lightning spell into the air as the signals start. Both airships lift off and they're off and going. We lose sight of them pretty quickly. Two hours later, the first pass. The hind is in the lead. Two hours after that, the hind crosses the finish line with no sight of the Rose. We have a big celebration. The Rose's captain is pissed. Well, an hour later, the Rose still hasn't showed up. We load up on the hind and head out in search and rescue mission. Sure enough, we find the wreck of the Rose in the foothills. It had an engine failure. We land and check for survivors. The pilot is dead, but the artificer's okay if injured. Apparently the mains failed due to stress and they swan dived into the side of a hill. The hull is wrecked, but there's enough of it left that the captain thinks it is salvageable. It looks like a mess of mangled wood to me. Austin and the Rhodes' artificer managed to get the mains back up to make it lighter so we can tow it back to Aegon's dry dock. Its captain seems to think he has enough money to pay for his repairs. Apparently his family is rich from their trade run. Maybe Austin can talk him into getting his auxiliary engines installed. For a price, of course. And that's the end of this episode of Stranded in Fantasy. The next episode is going to be longer and the final episode to this fantastic series. If you like this video and others videos like them, be sure to subscribe to Neckbeardia and click that little stupid bell icon so you know when the videos are released through the week. I am sorry for this delay in the video. I had a thing happen with the family. I had to take care of it, and it's done. So we should be back on schedule, fucking heaven's willing. 
for this week. This has been Guard Bro, and I will see y'all next time.